I have to say, I, in the midst of all the coronavirus doom and gloom, uh, I, I, I have been absolutely, uh, I mean, amused, I think, at uh, best, uh, by uh, the government's efforts to tackle the issue of channel migrants. And we've just seen, I mean, thousands and thousands of people crossing the channel over the summer months. Uh, obviously, those uh, numbers will go down as the weather has got uh, uh, worse and we're not seeing such a safe crossing uh, for those in those flimsy little blow up boats. Uh, but uh, there has been an awful lot of pressure on the government after Nigel Farage, actually, uh, the Brexit party leader, actually uh, highlighted how big the issue was, the scale on which we were looking. And Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, has been under an awful lot of pressure to live up to, well, all the hype that she was finally a Home Secretary who would take this all seriously. And yet we've had some interesting ideas put forward about how to tackle this. Uh, one has been uh, shipping off uh, everybody who claims uh, asylum into Ascension Islands. No, I had to look them up as well. Uh, remote UK territory in the South Atlantic Ocean, offshoring people. Uh, now there's some talk about putting them on either uh, unused, disused ferries or indeed uh, disused uh, uh, cruise liners and even other uh, suggestions of putting them on other islands. But um, what is the likelihood of any of this actually happening? Bella Sankey is Director of Detention Action and joins us now. Good morning to you, Bella. Good morning, Julia. Um, it does seem to me that the ideas seem to have sort of got, to a certain extent, sillier and sillier, but, but I know there will be some that will take some of these ideas seriously. Well, yes, I think you were being very polite in your introduction there, Julia, in calling them interesting ideas. Um, they are silly ideas, but they're also potentially quite dangerous ideas if any of them ever see the light of day. Offshore detention is not a new phenomenon. Australia has, of course, experimented with this over the past few decades, and the results there have been pretty harrowing. Um, industrial but scale, child abuse, um, abuse of women, um, all sorts of things go wrong when you start detaining people offshore and taking away their rights. So it is worrying that, you know, even if this is just kite flying by the government and, and kind of intentional to make sure it's looking tough on this issue, it is worrying that these plans are anywhere near Number 10's death. Well, hold on a minute, though. The Australian move to ha offshore all the migrants, they had a massive issue with migrants coming over on boats uh, and, and it was leading to a huge loss of life because of the incredibly choppy waters in the north of the country. And basically, when they said, this is it, you basically no one is going to step foot on Australian territory if you come by boat and people were being dealt with offshore and then shipped back home. We saw those boats stopping. We saw the an end to that massive loss of life um, and, and people were not gaining access to Australia who had no right to be there. Lots of people, and including me, would say that was a very successful policy. Um, I, I don't think it's been proven that um, offshoring has a deterrent effect. And actually, the people that were warehoused on Nehru overwhelmingly were found to have genuine protection claims. So it wasn't a case of people that didn't have a right to seek refugee status that were coming on those boats. Population flows and refugee flows are triggered by events, obviously, in people's home countries. And it's the same with those crossing the channel at the moment. The vast majority of people from Iraq, Yemen, um, Libya, places where there are obviously ongoing atrocities. And the vast majority, when they do get to have their claims properly looked at, are being successful. So it's not a, a case of, you know, that, 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 that there's, a, there's a problem here necessarily. In the UK, um, we haven't actually seen an increase in asylum applications. We've seen more people coming on the channel route, but the numbers have say, say, stayed really consistent. And if you compare us to the rest of Europe, France has, for example, four times the number of applications we do. So the idea that it is a problem um, that needs to, to some sort of radical solution, I think, is is really contentious. Really, I mean, again, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think it does need a radical solution because the numbers we've seen across the, uh, the the channel, I think, have been off the scale and incredibly dangerous. You say we haven't had a, um, a massive increase in the majority in in the number of claims. That's because of these people disappear into the black market. They they just disappear. These people are going to be exploited by people traffickers once they arrive on our shores, uh, let alone just on the way to get here. Um, you say people to carry on. <laughs> Just to clarify one point, um, I'm not saying that people crossing the channel isn't a problem. Of course it is, because it's a dangerous route. But the increase... It's also in illegal. The... It's not actually illegal, Julia, to claim asylum here and to come by... Um, a, a, an unusual... Sorry, I can't, I can't arrive in this country without a passport, and I'm British. 
you you could if you were claiming asylum if you were claiming asylum so that is actually a myth that's been but uh, you, you know, know under the dublin convention country. although not international the dublin convention says if you're coming from a safe country you need to stay in that safe country and claim asylum it doesn't, if, it doesn't that's actually wrong in law and i'm telling you this as, as someone with legal expertise that's not what the dublin convention says it says that states have the right to try and return somebody to a country they've passed through there's no obligation on someone to claim asylum in any country other than a country where they feel safe and that's a right that where safe they feel safe. hold on a minute so so how many was it what have we got almost seven billion people on the planet and anyone at any time can just say mm, i don't feel safe here whether it's ethiopia or sudan or or or, or libya or, or or i don't know the bahamas i don't feel safe here i want to come to britain and they have a right i mean you've got to understand why list people listening to this to think that's absurd that's not what I'm saying there. You're mischaracterising me there, Julia. People have a right to claim asylum. Of course, then the UK government will process their asylum claim. And that's a really tough process where um, not all of those that may have claims will have them accepted. Um, so it's not a free for all at all. But of course, the, the right to find safety has to be a personal one because people flee for all sorts of reasons. For example, in a Caribbean country where you or I might feel really happy to go on holiday, someone who's gay may be facing persecution. So there are all sorts of reasons why people claim but, asylum. But again, so, we, so we, we have a duty of care to take everybody from every country that doesn't have as progressive views as us. Again, a lot of people listening to this will say, I'm sorry, that's not our problem. Well, we're signed up to the Refugee Convention. So if people do make it to the UK, we do have a right to look at them. And we've, you know, throughout our history accepted refugees. The current sort of... Um, uh, circus around around the numbers arriving at the moment is really out of step with our history in 1914 on one day Folkestone accepted 16,000 Belgian refugees so these numbers are not sort of disproportionate or out of step with what we've dealt with before um, some refugees will eventually go back to the countries that they come from that's normally what refugees want to do when the war is ended or yeah. when it's safe but, for them but to you do but you know as well as i do that uh, you, young men aged sort of 18 to 25 are not the most needy they're not the most desperate if we're going to be accepting asylum seekers who are most needy and desperate surely it should be the the children and the elderly uh, rather well, than not, young healthy men we're not accepting anyone at the moment because there's no safe and legal route. So we have no schemes for the people you've identified, the children or the elderly to come. But let's remember that, that many, of the ch many of the people crossing the channel are children, often unaccompanied children that definitely need our care and protection. But another point, Julia, on this, on this issue of uh, the profile of people that are arriving, what often happens and when you speak to refugees is a family will send their yeah. healthy member to get here yeah. because they think that they stand the best chance of being able to make the very dangerous journey and all of the horrors that meet them on their way whether it's enslavement or modern trafficking um, and then they will send for their family so I think it's really important to kind of see that in context that yes some of the images you see people look relatively healthy but they will have daughters and grandmothers and part pregnant partners but, at home that but again and that's one of the issues for people is that actually when you see those people and you look at those numbers you know those numbers are going to rise hey there's a word we use a lot nowadays exponentially once those people do if they do uh, get asylum um, Bella I know we're going to talk to you again about this in the future I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and Bella Sankey a director of detention action there